part of the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, what's good, everyone? Thanks for stopping by on Sable Brothers on the Baseline Podcast, all part of the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm John Sable. And I'm Scott Sable. How you guys doing? Thank you for tuning in to this edition of our podcast. Now, if you're a avid listener of our show, you probably have already picked up that we're big into Cleveland sports. We, we love the history of Cleveland sports. And we also like interesting things when it comes to memorabilia. Now, we're not talking about like game used shoes by a player or an autograph card or a jersey or whatever, even though we do may have some of those. We are big into the most random parts of uh, some memorabilia, but especially about some random items that not necessarily Mm -hmm. you'll find in a store, but have that has a major history and a long, interesting story to, and that leads us to our guest today. Correct. And it all revolves around the old Richfield Coliseum. So what are we talking about specifically? Stay tuned. And we're going to have an interesting guest talking about that history right after this. Hey, everybody, it's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen. Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. The R&R podcast going to be rocking and rolling with you because football season is underway. College, Ohio State, the Power Fives, the Mac, the Browns. Michael Regai, are you ready to rock and roll with some football? Yeah, yeah, I've been ready. This is our time of year. This is what R&R is all about. We're going to be with you every week. Kenny just said it, Browns, NFL, Ohio State-centric. So you got to stay with us all fall and winter long here on R&R. That's right. The Red Eye and Rhoda podcast coming to you here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Subscribe now and don't miss a show. Hey, everyone. I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Jeremy Powell. And we are your hosts of the Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need each week to get you ready for kickoff and beyond. Don't miss our breakdowns of each week's matchups, game recaps, and any and all news out of Berea to feed your Browns appetite. As we all know, Holly, dogs gotta eat. That's right, Jeremy. Hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Orange Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Well, before we get to our main topic, I want to give you a little bit of history on the Richfield Coliseum. Now, if you're a young listener to our podcast, You more than likely don't remember the Richfield Coliseum because the last game the Cleveland Cavaliers played there was back in the mid-1990s, and then they ended up tearing down the Richfield Coliseum. I believe it was in 1999. Now, if you're driving in and around northern Ohio, the Richfield Coliseum is located at uh, the intersection of 303 and Interstate 271. There's a big field there right now. It's all a part of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, I believe, but that field is was the home of the Richfield Coliseum, uh, you name it, from Cleveland Cavaliers games to all sorts of sporting events. And you just, just Google the Richfield Coliseum and it'll give you the history here. So I wanted to set that up for what we're about to talk about here. Now, if you're a big Cleveland Cavaliers fan, you remember the Cavs games. You also remember the, the floor, the Cleveland Cavaliers playing surface that they, that they used for many years. But the big question is, how did that floor end up in Staunton, Virginia? The man that can shed light on all of this is George McNair. He is joining us here. He's a teacher, a basketball coach, and a guidance counselor at Grace Christian School in Staunton, Virginia. George, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I I appreciate y'all having me. And I I do have to uh, just correct one thing. It's It's actually pronounced Stanton. Is it really? It is. You well, I should so. know that because we used to we used to uh, work down in your your neck of the woods. I worked in Huntington, West Virginia, and my brother worked down in uh, uh, in portions of West Virginia. And we would always mispronounce certain cities because here in Northern Ohio, <laughs> they'll, they'll be pronounced one way, and you guys might yeah. do it a different way. So I apologize. Exactly. No problem. 
So how did your dad, who is, who is Randall and the Cavaliers meet and what prompted this? Um, what prompted the movement of the floor down to Virginia? Just take us back. So I was actually a, a 15 year old high school student at Grace Christian when um, we connected with the Cavaliers. And uh, it wasn't at first, it wasn't my dad. It was Gary Summers, who was the husband of our athletic director at the time. Okay. So I don't know every little nook and cranny of that story, but he knew a guy who knew a guy who knew the Gunn family, who were the owners of the Cavaliers. And um, somehow he got word uh, that they were were selling the floor. Uh, we are a tiny little uh, Christian school, and we did not even have a gym at the time. It was just a dream of maybe one day having our own floor. And so, um, but anyways, he, he heard it was for sale and just jumped on it. Um, and so my dad comes into the story. He was the assistant basketball coach for the varsity girls team. So him and the head coach of the girls team, uh, along with their wives, um, including my mom. So they went to Cleveland just out of the blue because we're all hearing this story and like, it doesn't even make sense. It's surreal. Like, yeah, right. Um, this is not a real thing. So they go to uh, the Richfield Coliseum. They put eyes on the floor. This is actually a real thing. And um, he put a thousand dollars deposit down <laughs> to hold the floor. Um, and so that's, that's how it all started. So George, take us back to that day when you and your father and, and company drove up from Virginia to Richfield, Ohio, because Richfield's in the middle of nowhere to take a look right. at that floor at the Coliseum. What do you remember specifically about that trip as a 15 year old kid? Well, I keep using the word surreal because I mean, I was, I'm just, I love basketball, you know, and this is the, to me, the heyday of basketball. I mean, this is, this is the nineties and um, you know uh, the era of, of Jordan and, you know, uh, all, all those guys. And so it was um, number one, it was in the middle of nowhere, like <laughs> Richfield Coliseum was in a field. And so that was kind of funny, but um, we just went, I mean, it was 15 guys. Um, three of us were, were current um, high school students and then the rest were dads and we just got in a couple vans uh we um hired a couple of 18 wheel trucks and we just it was like a road trip uh we called a local church we slept on their floor they let us sleep on the floor overnight nobody got any sleep um and we got them the next day and it was just an all day in the richfield coliseum mm -hmm. and it's just a it's a crazy memory because um much of the Coliseum had been gutted. I mean, you know, they'd moved out. And so no one was in there and we were just kind of given free reign uh, to go in. And so the story is too, it wasn't just the floor. Like originally we were sold the floor, but um, we were also in contact with the gun family. And over time they realized we had more needs. And so it became the two, um, the two hydro road baskets. It was, um, you know, we, we got out on the, the practice floor. So our side rooms at our gym are from the the practice floor of the calves. Um, even our sinks are the sinks in our bathroom are from the, the bathrooms of the Coliseum. No so kidding. we were just, it was, it was like a treasure hunt of what could you, what could you find and what, you know, what could you, what could you use? When you walked into the Coliseum and you said it was gutted, were the seats in the stands still there or were those gone too? There was actually another group uh, in there who, who were taking the seats. That, that was the only thing they were taking. And then we were basically, there were a few areas we were told were kind of off limits or things we couldn't take, but pretty much everything else, it, they were like, if you can fit it in the trucks, um, you can have it. Wow. And, and the pictures that you emailed Scott earlier are tremendous of the kids playing on it. And when... Yeah this podcast goes live and when we tweet it out and post it on Facebook and everything, we're going to use those pictures. So we appreciate you sending those right. to us. And I yeah. can't help but look in the background and I can see the, the basketball goals, the original um, orange hoops with the, um, <laughs> the blue padding and the NBA logo in the bottom right. left-hand corner of the glass of the backboard, which is just tremendous. I had no idea you got the sinks. That's awesome. You know, Scott, yeah. Scott and I are kind of um, we have a you know big passion for Cleveland sports and, and some, odd random memorabilia like we both have a seat from the one of the original stadiums in cleveland municipal stadium where the browns and indians played and right. just in the last five years uh, we both stumbled upon two 
Coliseum chairs, uh, floor seats. <laughs> right. So I was just curious about your uh, the inside of what it looked like because we attended well, many games there. Yeah, I mean, there's there's random stuff we got. So again, uh, me and my buddy, uh, two high school kids, are just walking around the Coliseum and like everywhere. Like we can go into the owner's box, and we took two of the owner's chairs. They so. <laughs> Fast forward 20 years, I'm the guidance counselor. I'm using those chairs as my office chairs. No way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, these blue like polyester chairs. But, you know, it was it was stuff like that that you just it was like, OK, we'll, we'll take these two and we'll, <laughs> we can use these. And one of your uh, pictures, so just, yeah. one of your pictures in that you sent, Scott, I see orange fold up chairs along the baseline of the wall. Are those from the Coliseum or are those separate? Yeah, I, sh- I should have included that. So, yes, we got every orange chair uh we use them to this day as our bench chairs um if we you know if we have like our homecoming night where we're packing out the whole the whole place we'll we'll put those at the end of of you know the the floor and uh we got like 200 of them and uh, wow. they're starting to fall wow. apart a little bit but uh, most of them are in pretty good shape and uh, they're pretty comfortable chair were those in the locker room um i think some of them were mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah but i mean you know, these are, you just start thinking like sure. who's sitting in this chair, right? Yeah. You know, um, that's, that sort of thing goes through your mind a lot. Man. I know Scott, I could see Scott here on the zoom call. He's, right. he, he's grinning ear to ear. We just love these kind of stories with that. So uh, what was your first impression of the Coliseum, even though that it was gutted and, and you getting the floor that all those greats, Jordan magic bird, not to mention all the countless Cavs greats played on it. What was your first right. impression of it? It, I mean, it was huge, uh, you know, and I, I had never been to an NBA game uh, at that point in my life. So it was just kind of um, you're just taking it all in and, you know, in your mind, you're, you're imagining all the all the moments that have happened there. And, you know, like I said, I'm a huge basketball fan. So I was familiar, you know, I was familiar with all the um, particularly great Cavs teams. I always like Mark Price and, you know, um, you know, of course, the Jordan shot on Hilo, which, I, you know, sorry to bring that up, Cavs yeah, well, fans, but, you know, but <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm sorry, uh, but, you know, still great NBA history happened there. And so that I was definitely uh, aware of that. You mentioned Mark Price. You see his jersey right here? Where my I absolutely daughter? see his jersey. Yep. So I got I, I got to mention this. So one thing we are, we weren't allowed to take any jerseys. That was one thing we weren't allowed to take. Um, but there were a few other things like warm ups. Um, that some were available because they weren't personalized to a player, but the shorts had, had numbers scribbled in it. And um, I, I may or may not have some shorts with a number 25 on it. Wow. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great well, story. Well, Scott, you want to tell them when we had Mark Price on the podcast, Mark Price was our first guest. And I asked yeah. him if he had every single jersey right. and shorts that he had, and he has a lot of them still. So he's not missing those, right, Scott? No, no, definitely not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, and they, you know, this is the day where the shorts were shorter, and I guess Mm -hmm. that style is coming back. But um, but they're they're long enough to fit me, and I'm five eight, so you know (laughs) it kind of works out. So, if you don't mind me asking, what did the Cavs quote you for the price of the floor? Did you have an idea going in what they were gonna what they were asking, or was it you get up there and then they kind of spring this on you? So, from what I've been told, the price was twenty six thousand dollars. Um, which is probably a pretty good deal. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what it would go for today, but um, you know, one thing I will say that I do know is, um, and this is from my dad, is that it got out in Cleveland. You know that the the floor was being sold, and that that was. I don't know if the price got out, but many people, as you can imagine, uh, were kind of interested in buying that floor. And um, the Gun family, to their credit, you know they they honored their agreement with us. And, um, it's been, it's been a major blessing. I mean, you you imagine our little high school and how many games have been played, how many practices have been played by hundreds of kids over the years on that floor. It's continued to be in use, right. For its own, for its original purpose, uh, basketball games are played on that floor all the time. That's great. How did you manage to, again, from, from when you knew the floor was available to when you came up there, how much time ha- had elapsed so you could organize 
you know, getting the trucks, getting all the people, how long, how long did it take you to organize all that? I would imagine it wasn't a, a lot, a long time. No, I mean, this is a guess to me, but I, I would say weeks. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, very quickly, we, we had to do it. We had to move. And, um, and I mean, like I said, we, we were a small school. We didn't have our own gym. So we were incredibly motivated to do this. Um, as a, as a um, athlete of the school at the time, student athlete, I mean, we were nomadic. We would play in any gym we could locally. And so this was, any four would have been amazing for us. And so this was just, you know, over the moon. Now, I read somewhere a few years ago or a few years after the fact that when you guys installed the court in the school, there was some talk, not amongst your your dad or, you you know, you as a kid or, or Gary Summers, but some people were talking about putting the school's logo on the court, but they were adamant not to. I mean, that's right. pretty cool that you guys didn't do that. And to this day, it still says the Coliseum at center court and the two calves blue circles. Yeah. I mean, we, um, I think anyone who loves basketball and the history of basketball would never touch that. Um, so we, we definitely had some people in the school walk in and be like, you know, why does it say calves? We're the warriors. <laughs> this doesn't make much <laughs> sense, but it is, it's basketball history. And I, I'm very glad that it's never been touched. So um, I don't imagine it, it will be anytime soon. <laughs> as long as I have a word, you know, we'll, we'll keep it just as it is. Now that we're what, 25 years, roughly speaking, you know, from, from, from the time where you moved the floor, you know, we're getting now to the time where you were getting now to generation, generation and a half removed. Do you still have parents and, 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 and staff ask about the floor, the history of the floor, the kids, do you still get stories or, or is that, is that whole aspect of it fading away? Yeah, I think um, you're right. We are a generation removed. And so I'm one of the few, uh, because I was young and now, now I'm working at the school. I'm one of the few that have that direct connection. Um, so the story is less known. We do have kind of a, a an honorary, um, picture and, and whatnot at the front of this, uh, the gym when you walk in. So there's some knowledge of it, and obviously the gym itself, people are going to ask questions. Um, but I try as the basketball coach, I, I try to share that story with my players uh, as much as possible. And um, you know, it's, uh, it's an almost unbelievable story. And so it's definitely one worth, worth sharing. Do kids, still ask questions about it? I know we talk about the generation gap of parents, but like do some of the kids or, or is that something that they already know going into the school because the word of mouth and the legend of the floor and especially growing up in your community? Yeah, I, we, we definitely get get questions. I think um, I was telling some of my players the other day, I, I just recently um, watched the um, the Bulls documentary that, you mm-hmm. know, that came out um, mm-hmm. and one, one of the episodes that's talking a lot about uh, those 80s Cavs teams that were so good and, you know, probably maybe should have made uh, at least a final, mm-hmm. right? But, um, and there's the floor. And it's, that happens to me every now and then, you know, they'll, they'll right. show some highlight and there's the floor. And I get that from my kids too. You know, it's, um, they'll see it suddenly, um, you know, in a ESPN classic or something like that. And, uh, it's just, it's really special and, um, I think it also fosters a, a love for the game, um, mm-hmm. especially for, for my players. No question. And, you know, it would be really neat someday to get one of the Cavs players or an NBA player on that floor and get a picture of them on the floor. Just <laughs> say, hey, look, here, here's the connection. <laughs> Absolutely. That would my guys would get nuts over that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, George, before we let you go, I, I wanted to clarify something. You guys also got the practice floor as well and we didn't get just... the we didn't get the practice floor we got the practice um rims and oh, rims backboards okay. so those are our side rims um, mm. on the side of the gym which i don't know if you can see in the pictures that i shared mm-hmm. or not but um but yeah that was that was another thing like our um our um scoreboard um which is still going somehow there was a huge scoreboard in the practice gym that we also use as our main scoreboard wow um so it's there's just so much i'm telling you you walk into our gym, there's a ton of Cleveland basketball history just sitting right there. And it's basically all been preserved. I remember being in that practice uh, uh, floor. I was like in sixth grade at the Coliseum and we all went as a, on a field trip. 
uh, you know, with, with our basketball yeah. team. And that was right when Mark Price came into the league. And, you know, we're sitting there as like, you know, 11, 12 year old kids and he's there shooting free throw, just making every one of them. And I remember right. that practice floor and the side rims. And that's cool that you guys have all that. That's really neat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's funny. I never got to actually go into that practice part of the Coliseum like Scott did when he was younger, but you can Google pictures of it. And we had um, former Cavs coach Mike Fratello on mm-hmm. the podcast and uh, recently, and he talked about coaching there and he talked to coaching as a member of the Hawks and then as a member of the Cavaliers. And then when they moved right. into the arena downtown and he would talk about that practice floor and the walls with all the asbestos sprayed on the yes. side of it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. It is, is. It was the weirdest place ever to play basketball. It had to be. Yeah. And it was actually, I believe, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't it yeah. upstairs? I think so. It was that a weird right. spot. That mm-hmm. sounds right. You wouldn't even know it's there. Mm-hmm. I, in fact, I think we almost basically just discovered it. Because, again, wow. we were walking in and we didn't have a lot of like, go here for this, go here for that. Sure. It was just find what you can. And, right. and that was, one, that was a huge thing. And then we, then we have to figure out how do we get this gigantic, uh, you know, scoreboard down? And yeah. Right. One. Yeah. They probably said, if you want it, you got to get your own stuff and take it down. Exactly. And it still <laughs> works to this day, George. It still works. I mean, we obviously, we had to replace the bulbs and I think probably an electrician had to, you know, do some serious gutting to it, but it's <laughs> still there. Wow. Anything else that you can remember that you haven't told us yet that you, you were able to grab before he left? Um, nothing major. I think we hit all the, the major things. Right. Um, yeah. but I'll tell you this too, uh, for those who don't know, you know, that, that floor comes in sections It's mm-hmm. all in these panels. And, um, so the installation, you know, it took us two years to build the gym and I'm waiting to play on it. Um, and I got to play my senior year of high school on that floor. Um, cool. but but we were, we installed and we're just a bunch of regular dudes. We've never done this before. And so it's like a puzzle piece, putting it together. Hopefully we're doing this right. And, um, you know, we've never had a problem with it since, but I, I still remember that day of finally installing it. And then, you know, this very clear memory of finally getting to play on it. Where did you store it during those two years? I think just in like local storage. Mm. I, I don't know specifically, but I mean, yeah, it, it's set and, it, and you can imagine the anticipation of oh, yeah. having the floor, but not having the gym yet. I had to wait two long years. Do any of the kids or do anybody else when they play on it, complain of any dead spots on it? You dribble, dribble and it balls. I was going to ask that. Yeah. I can tell you there are a couple dead spots on it, but um, <laughs> it's still the most beautiful floor um, in our league. <laughs> Scott, do you want to tell George about Mike Fratello's floor real quick? Oh, you mean? Oh yeah. Cause he got a piece of a different floor. And he had, uh, well, he had not a piece, but he had an, an area for his, his, his basement. Okay. And then, uh, then he had a water leak and then it all got damaged and he had to throw it all out. Is that the story you were talking about? John? <laughs> yeah. And he had it under his pool table. And so yes, apparently, yes. apparently George, there were two floors unbeknownst to us, the one that you got, and they must've had a backup floor somewhere. Okay, and, it, it, which and, makes it, sense. and the practice floor, did the practice floor have from what you're, you remember the, the same design when you walked in there as a kid as the one that you have, or was it more plain? I'm almost wondering if that had already been taken out mm. because I don't remember it. Yeah. Yeah. So either, um, Fratello got either the backup floor or the practice floor that was the same right. one. Right. So yeah, he had a, uh, he had it in his basement for years and it was a big section and it took over like half his basement and then water leak and <laughs> ruined the pool table and ruined his floor. Oh so, man. <laughs> so you have the, you have like the Holy grail of Cleveland sports basketball courts, if you will still. Yeah. And we've had some, you know, local people who are from the area um, find out about it. And it's like, they, they take the pilgrimage to see it and they're in awe, you know, it's uh, they want to just get down on their knees and touch it. Wow. Well, George, George, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I know you're busy with all of your, you know, you're a teacher, you're, you know, you're a counselor and then you have basketball practice. And then I know this is probably the last thing you want to do on a, you know, in the middle of the week, but thank you so much. We really wanted to get this story and and hear it from you guys. And we want to wish you guys the best of luck and uh, happy holidays and, uh, and, uh, and certainly a a prosperous new year. Well, I appreciate it guys. Merry Christmas. I, uh, it was fun. Thanks so much, George. Thanks a lot. 
Scott, I never thought we'd be in interviewing a guidance counselor for a, as a school down in Virginia on our podcast. But man, George McNair had a wealth of knowledge and a great story about the original Richfield Coliseum floor that the Cavs played on in the late 80s and early mm-hmm. to mid 90s. Wow, that's tremendous. And it, it's, it it's still there. It's still there. And it's been, what, 25 years. And what I found fascinating is that not only do they have the floor, but they have the goals. And if you and we're going to put some pictures up on on Twitter, uh, you know, you, you'll recognize the goals and the NBA logo on the goals. And uh, and because they're also um, in, in all the videos that you see of all the big shots, like unfortunately, Jordan shot over Ely, you can see those goals. Those are the ones that they have in their gym, along with some other stuff that they just came across and they said, hey, if you want it, you can have it. That was fascinating. And I looked at those pictures and when, when he sent those to us, Scott, right. and you'll see him here on Twitter, on our uh, Twitter handles, those chairs on the sidelines, those are locker room chairs and some bench chairs that they had still to this day. They had sinks from the Coliseum that they still use in their gym, um, uh, multiple basketball courts, the scoreboard and the practice the scoreboard. Facility. Yes. I remember that. Cause you know, like I said before, I, I remember being in that, uh, uh, in that practice gym back in like 1985, 86, and they have it there. Um, it still works to this day, 25 years later. And what's, what's really cool about all of this is that, uh, the parents, I know we're kind of a generation removed, but the kids really appreciate, you know, that floor, you know, they appreciate where it came from. They're, they're aware of the history and, you know, that's something special, especially when you can play on a floor that says Cavaliers. A lot of people might not know where it's from, but but they get the story real quick. They do. And you can tell from looking at these pictures. And again, if you are uh, listening to us on Spotify or, or Apple Podcasts, just go to our Twitter handles at John underscore Sable and Sable Brothers and Scott Sable FOX8 on our handles. You'll see some of these pictures here of what the floor looks like and the kids the kids that are there on the court surround uh, sitting and standing around the center court of the Coliseum logo on the floor. It is pretty cool to see uh, kids that weren't even a, what would you and dad say when we were little, not a twinkle in God's twinkle eye. Twinkle in God's eye. Oh yeah. Yeah. Around exactly. that time. <laughs> right. So, and 25 years ago, I mean, the parents, I mean, he was 15 years old when, when, when they made the trek up to Cleveland with trucks and all that to get the, get the floor. So, uh, but it was an, it's a neat story. It's a story that, um, you know, bits and pieces of the story have been told over time, but it's nice to talk to the people who are actively involved mm-hmm. in, in the entire process. Very cool to see. I, I love that it's still there and it's been there 25 years and I hope they never get rid of it. I hope, uh, you know, nothing ever happens. So we want to thank George McNair again for taking the time to uh, telling us that incredible story. Absolutely. So you can uh, find this podcast and all of our episodes. You can find us on Twitter on Sable Brothers. You can follow my brother, John, John underscore Sable, as well as myself at Scott Sable F-O-X on Twitter. And don't forget to like and subscribe our podcast, Sable Brothers on the Baseline on Spotify and on Apple. So with all of that, I wish everybody a, a extremely happy and prosperous new year. And John, it's been great. And uh, who knows what we're going to have coming up here in 2022. Yeah, it's been a great uh, ride, I should say, for the first uh, six months of this podcast and everything else we've been doing. And we're looking forward to a nice, uh, healthy and safe 2022. Thanks for listening, everyone. 